Hello friends, thank you for joining me again today. My name is Dan and I am all the way up to Daily Art Adventure number 598. <laughs> and for want of a better title, I've called it the magic of subtle layering. Now, I struggled. That's, that's slightly misleading, but never mind. Let's just get into what I what I want to talk about, no matter what I label it. <laughs> no rerun sidewalks. Oh, Willie, you're in here early today. All right. Um, especially for any of you who are, for any crazy reason, <laughs> trying to be influenced by my technique, let me talk specifically to you for a minute. The rest of you, the principle, the broad principle here is, number one, the human eye loves subtlety. That's what I say, the human eye, you understand. I mean, the seeing part of our brain loves visual subtlety and, and is capable of, capable of discerning degrees of subtlety in a sense far beyond our ability to produce such subtlety so you don't have to worry about being overly subtle for your eyeballs now you can be subtle with mind tricks but no I'm just talking about pure visual here one of the key tricks I employ then to satisfy this our brain our minds desire for high degrees of subtlety one of the tricks i employ in the don't use the term overpainting we all use the term underpainting but i have taken to using the term overpainting because in my world there's such a strong distinction between the two so in the overpainting state which i'm in now which is almost all light and opaque. I spend much of my time trying to match the colors that are already on the canvas. I think I might be zoomed in as far as I can get. Yeah, it looks like it. I'll tell you what, I mean, I don't do this very often, but let me actually pick you up and move you physically. So I can get you in here as close as possible. So you can all see that red stripe, that red line that runs at an angle throughout this street. And of course, you all know, you regulars, that that is not an attempt on my part to try to capture some realistic uh, element that I saw on the street. It was not like, oh, there's a there's a line that goes through the street. No, 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 no. It is it is not um, similitude at all. It's simply there because it looks interesting, and it's there. It was put there in a moment of spontaneity and freedom. But now it's my job. I have the the prerogative of wiping it out completely if I so choose. What, what always surprises me is how rarely I choose that option. I rarely obliterate these, these marks that I put down in the underpainting stage. But, but I do often do what you see me doing right here, which is I diminish them somewhat. I diminish the marks. So that, that red mark, you can still see it. See right there? I've just carved, I've skinnied it up. I've carved into it on both sides. But this wouldn't work if the color that I've got on my brushes right now didn't match what's already there. And of course, it's different colors around there. So as I do much of this overpainting layer, I spend much energy matching color. In other words, mixing up colors that 
are almost exactly what's already there. Now, almost exactly, but slightly lighter. It's okay to be lighter than what's already there. It is not okay to be darker. If you're in, if you're using opaque paints, remember dark opaque paint equals mud. We've had quite a few conversations on my web, on my channel here over the years about what mud is. And I do, and I've come to, I have come to understand that a number of artists and teachers use the term mud f to refer to many, several different things. Um, I, I am indeed going to pull rank on you. <laughs> um, for this reason, that some people say that mud is when you're painting a la prima, that means all at once, wet on wet on wet, and you simply build up too much, too many layers of paint so that what you put down ends up just smooshing with what's already there and becoming, quote unquote, a muddy mess. Now, I can understand that use of the word mud. Here's the reason I will not go that direction. The reason is if you use the word mud for that phenomenon, which is perfectly understandable, but if you use the word mud to refer to thick layers of paint that you know become like peanut butter and jam all mushing together, then you've got no word left for a much more subtle and important problem of painting, which is what I call mud. Now, in my world, the wor that is to say that when I'm talking about mud, the phenomenon is almost an inscrutable mystery. Here's the kind of terminology, here's the kind of verbiage that happens inside the artist's head with my kind of mud. You put down a color and you're troubled by it. You scratch your head, you stroke your chin, you furrow your brow, <laughs> and you say, I don't know what's wrong with this color. It looks muddy. And uh, if you already used the word mud to refer to that multiple layers of goop, then you're lost because you don't have any language left over to describe what is most certainly not multiple layers of wet goop. Okay? So, mud is, in my world, any part of the canvas that you've attempted to make slightly darker, any part of the painting that you've tried to make slightly darker using white paint. Now, the, okay, getting mud is getting dark with white paint. <laughs> and I hope that sounds, what? If you're paying any attention, you should be saying, what? That's insane. Why would we try to get, why would we try to get dark with white paint and that sh hang up your your question there your intuition is exactly correct why would you well i'll answer the question here's why beginner artists want to be entry level emerging artists here's why they use they might use or you might use white <laughs> hey hello my U ukrainian friend i am so glad that you I am so glad you corrected me. <laughs> I wish I knew your language as well enough to discern the difference. Sorry for that insult, my friend. <laughs> and thank you for correcting me. Good to have you on board. I'm glad I saw your chat right then. I would see it later, but I'm glad I saw it right now while you're still on. So, <laughs> my Ukrainian friend. Whew. I understand that. Get me in some hot water over there. <laughs> When I was in seminary, I did study Greek, and I still I still read Greek, and so um, that should give me a slight advantage in discerning some um, Eastern languages. What shall I call them that? But alas, I haven't not studied 
Russian or Ukrainian well enough to discern the difference. I think you all use the same letters. Is that right? They're very closely related. Anyway, thank you for joining me. All right. Um, why would anyone, why would anyone in their right mind <laughs> use white paint to create a dark color? Here's why. It's very simple. Here's the logic. Here's what the student is thinking. They would say, well, I want some part of my painting to be slightly darker, but only a little bit darker. So I'm going to add white to my paint so it just gets a little bit darker, not real dark. That's, that's the faulty and er erroneous thinking that students go through. That's why they add white to a color. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to demonstrate that for you right here. If you want to see a demonstration of everything I'm talking about right, right now, um, as soon as this video is, the broadcast is over, do a search for Dan Nelson Mud. It's about a 10 minute video where I demonstrate this quite clearly about what is the mis the mysterious form of mud uh, I don't care about the th the thick you know mixing because that's that's not mysterious everybody can say if, if you have uh, the other definition of mud which is layers and layers and layers of wet stuff that's all gooping together and creating mud that's not a mystery that's easy and the answer is stop just don't do it <laughs> So avoiding that kind of mud is black and white, simple, punctilious. That's a one point of action. One point of action. All you have to do is quit, and then you won't get to have that problem. I'm being a little facetious here. But the, the mud that I talk about is, is almost a metaphysical mystery. People can't figure out why does this color not look right. And I've just given you the answer. It's because... The artist has tried to make some part of their painting slightly darker using an opaque color. Okay, what I really wanted to talk about in this broadcast, though, is this subtle matching of color. So let's take this area right in here. And again, I'll zoom in to, to the left of this figure. See this, this color back here. I, what color is that? I I don't know what to call it. I mean, obviously it's a brown. It's kind of a greenish, kind of a greenish brown. Let's see if I'm close. I'm pretty close. A little bit too light. Let me darken that. Just like I can leave those marks, okay? But for my next marks. So there we go. I've matched it very closely to what's already there. And I'm going to put down just a few little tiny dots, marks, so that our eye is confused slightly. Now, that, does, that sounds like a negative thing. We don't want to be confused in life. Generally speaking, that is correct. But when it comes to visual art, in fact, yes, we enjoy the sensation of being confused. Very counterintuitive, but true. So, I don't like this pale mark on the outside of that person's head. Let me mix up a slightly paler color now and do some just a bit of flesh tone right there and maybe down there, maybe there to suggest flesh tone. Is he wearing shorts? He might be he or she. Looks like a he to me. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm not sure where I'm going next, so let's just back out for a minute. If you don't mind, I'm going to move my way. If you were with me yesterday, you can see that I've done quite a bit of work on my own without your c 
company, sorry about that, has to be done sometimes. Another principle that I'll, that's related to this subtle layering is any opportunity that you get in your painting, anytime, any opportunity you have to paint in the negative rather than the positive, take it. Anytime you can paint. So here's a tree, right? Here's the trunk comes up here you can see there's some foliage in front of the trunk right up there and then there's branches that go out it's a it's a mostly bare tree because this photograph was taken this painting is done in the early spring so of course you can tell I've taken something dark black paint I'm mean, not black but dark paint and even some pencils and uh, roughed in those branches but now, as I'm finishing this tree, I'm not painting the branches, I'm painting between the branches. Again, this is related to the, the mind, pleasure, delight in being confused, mildly confused. Why, why is it confusing? Because Everybody logically knows, without a shadow of a doubt, we know that this tree is in front of that building. So we know the building is behind the tree. You with me? But when we put the building color orange-brown paint in front of the tree, it causes a tiny little split second of confusion. The same principle is, is what we employ all the time when we do sky holes. So these are sky holes. You've heard me <laughs> rant and rave many times before that they should not be called sky holes and this is exactly why. Because that is not sky. It's a building behind that tree. So what do we call it then? A building hole? How absurd. So if I had been invited to the committee that decided such things 175 years ago, I'm making that up, um, they should have been called tree holes. So, henceforth and forever, <laughs> I'm going to start calling them tree holes. So those are tree holes, and the, again, a little bit of confusion. Our 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 brain, our mind enjoys that. While I'm on this, while I'm on the subject, let's let's do more of the same, right back here. So I have a a more pale. Um, yellow building back there. So the tree holes here are going to be lighter and more yellow. And I, I'm trying to, once again, I'm trying to match the color that's already there. So that's one of the big concepts I would like to get across today is in the overpainting stage, in my approach to painting, in the overpainting stage, you spend much time and energy trying to match the colors that are already on the canvas. Does that make sense? Well, again, let, let's do some right up here on this building. So switching now to wiping the paint off the tissue, switching to a darker brown, and definitely redder, more red and more brown. I use just enough liquid at this in this stage of the painting just to help the paint dry a little faster. Not to make it transparent because I don't want it transparent. I just use enough liquid to make the colors dry, make the paints dry quickly. Ah, that's a little bit too busy or obvious. So I'm going to paint with a fingernail and a rag. There we go. That's better. And quick 
detour, pick up some pale green. It's a trick I use often, by the way, when I'm doing foliage. I roll the brush, literally roll the brush, roll the paint off the brush when I'm doing foliage like that, leaves at a distance. All right, so I've got this fairly dark reddish brown paint. Let's just look for some excuses to put it somewhere. So basically, I'm looking for parts of the painting that already have hints of this in it. Not much detail up there at all, you understand. I know you do understand that. Very little. <sighs> Nearly finished with this stage of the painting. There was some discussion yesterday at, I saw at the end of, after I had brought, after I'd finished broadcasting, I can't remember if it was a chat or a comment, someone was, someone was asking about some perspective issues on, I think, on this blue building. And uh, um, I'm not sure what they meant, but all I will say is that, um, no, that anything, mistake that you think you might see, over here is is uh, purely um, a visual. What's the word? Optical. That's what optical illusion. Because uh, the pretty much all these lines, the verticals, I, I tested with a T square. So I'm. Sorry, I'm not responding very very accurately to the comments but whoever that was if you're watching thanks for your thoughts thanks for your suggestions i feel pretty pretty confident that those these marks these buildings the the perspective is correct actually I, i've actually done quite a bit more of uh this kind of thing in this in this painting you know, more than, than I usually do. Vanishing point right there. And so I've actually physically double checked much of many of my lines, most of my lines in this painting. That is indeed, you are correct. That is a mistake you can't afford to let slide.
the the white uh, vertical marks on this building are very distinctive in our downtown street. I'm not going to paint them nearly as accurate or rigid as they are in reality, of course. But I do want to give the impression of those vertical straight lines. I've mentioned before, for some reason, my left hand, I am very much right-handed, but for some reason, my left hand makes vertical marks better than my right hand. Isn't that funny? I have no idea why. All right, I think I'm going to end this broadcast here. I'm going to paint for just a few minutes without, without your company. But I'll be back very soon um, for a short broadcast about broken color. All right, so I won't be gone for long. Um, but because I'm going to change topics significantly, I'll, I'll end this broadcast. And again start the last layer or next to last layer to, to tell you where I'm going next layer next stage next phase broken color and then I stop for the day and tomorrow when I come back all of this should be dry and I do glazes over the entire thing and final touch-ups whatever that ends up being I, not my job at this point to know what those final touch-ups are I won't know until I get there all right thanks for watching Whoops, hang on, hang on, I'm missing some chats here. Hi, Michael, welcome to the club, man. We're all stuck in detail. Uh, and Herfinur, Herfinur, sorry if I'm no, it is um, the, the light that I'm using, I'll show you, it's, a, it's not fancy, it's an LED bulb. Uh, and it was it was labeled daylight. Let me see if it's got a number on it. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kelvin. I do not see a Kelvin number on it, but I, it was it was labeled daylight. And uh, yeah, I find it. I am finding it quite quite helpful. Uh, other comments. Zamorite art, how many layers? Um, the answer is 13 to 15, I think. 13 to 15 different stages. So I've got two to go. So I don't know.